you know, today when you look at somebody who's maybe wagering on a game, right, there are data sources that are going to tell you the lines and the odds. Um, but, you know, certainly the prediction models uh, that are coming out that are leveraging AI uh, provide another level of sophistication uh, around the world. I think what you are able to do with machine learning and then with AI and, you know, running models against predictive outcomes um, is staggering, right? And I think, you know, you see it in some games, I believe EA ran simulations of the World Cup you know the last the last three world cups they were correct in picking the winners in two of the three world cups um that came out the running simulations today we're having a conversation with kai bond kai bond is a partner at courtside ventures an early stage venture capital firm that invests in companies at the intersection of sports gaming and lifestyle kai great to see you once again welcome to the show Pleasure. Thanks for having me. A lot of people know about courtside, but not a lot of people know, know how you got your start. Can you walk us through that? You know, I started off my career at Microsoft, um, early 2000s, working in the mobile division um, and had a keen interest in gaming. Um, spent a lot of time in uh, Japan and Korea and just saw how big gaming was, particularly on mobile phones or even at that point in time. So, um, you know, I came back, I ended up joining a few startups uh, in the gaming space. And after a few years, decided to take the jump in as an entrepreneur. Uh, over the course of about seven years, I started three different companies, uh, two in the gaming space, one as an interactive media company in sports. Um, and it was at that point in time uh, in, you know, 2012, where I first met the team at Courtside, who had been working in and around the world of sports. Um, they helped me navigate uh, a lot of the world of relationships and, um, you know, once I successfully exited my business, I started co-investing with them. So we spent about three years co-investing. Um, I was at Comcast Ventures. Uh, I was leading gaming investments um, for their flagship fund. And when Fund 2 and Courtside kicked off, uh, which was around 2019, I joined the team at Courtside. And so been there ever since. Um, and it's been a good run so far. Can you tell us more about Courtside, what you're looking at, what motivates you, and basically give us a kind of like an, out, an outlook in terms of what you see in the space of gaming and in, uh, in sports? Yeah, so uh, Courtside Ventures is an early stage investor in sports and gaming. Uh, we have uh, raised uh, since 2016 three funds uh, where we deploy early stage. So we do, you know, pre seed through Series A and, you know, we have a team, <clears throat> the genesis of Portside really came about. My partner Vasu started a company out of his college dorm room at Penn. Uh, he grew that business, um, you know, into a $10 million ARR business and never raised one round of institutional capital. And, you know, in, in this period of time, you know, in, the, in 2010, no one believed that venture was a, that sports was a venture backable asset class. And so when he exited, uh, he saw the white space in the market, came together with the other founding partner, Deepin, and, you know, first fund was really a proof of concept, right? Identify deals in the world of sports that are at venture scale. Um, and that was the, the, the real genesis of the fund, you know, and over the course of the, the next several funds, we've continued to refine our thesis, right? We operate in our lanes of sports and gaming, but as technology shifts, as distribution shifts, as consumption patterns shift, you know, we try to look out ahead and say like, what are the trends that are going to be driving content distribution, consumption, engagement, in and around what are two of the largest, you know, areas of the passion economy, right? Sports is global. Yeah. Uh, you see that with things like the Olympics and the World Cup. Um, you, if you're a fan of an English Premier League team and you go to Africa or Southeast Asia or Latin America, you'll see Arsenal and Manchester United jerseys, Chelsea jerseys on folks. And so we, you know, we see that as a, uh, a huge opportunity to invest globally. Um, so we, we very much think that there's an opportunity there. Um, every fund has a different thesis, right? In some funds early on, we look at media as a huge opportunity uh, with the changing consumption behavior of a younger audience. Uh, and then you see, you know, the evolution of esports into sports. And what does that mean, right? What are streaming platforms that drive engagement? 
Um, and then the gaming thesis, really, when we started looking at esports and seeing the flow of revenue and where the biggest opportunity was, flew into game. Um, and so, you know, each fund, whether that's social gaming experiences, whether that's streaming services, uh, whether that's real money gaming. Um, and as we look forward, you know, we see a massive opportunity. Um, I think as everyone does in almost any industry with AI coming in and providing, you know, another technological revolution that will change the way in which you know, games are created, produced, the way in which users engage with those games. Um, in the way in which, you know, uh, in the sports world, uh, you know, data is captured, the way it's analyzed um, and how that is, you know, informing decisions around player performance um, and outlooks uh, the, through the course of the season. Interesting. Right, right, right. So when you look, I, I'm not, I don't know if you saw this, but this past week, I believe it was a few days ago, um, just the past week, Valve, the makers of Steam, which distributes a lot of a lot of games, they reverse policy saying that developers can use AI. They just have to disclose it. So now as we go into this whole new era of of AI empowered and supercharged um, by these new platforms and, and, and snapped into the, the gaming world as we know it. What are your expectations around that? And let's talk about how that's going to change the gaming experience from the investor side, as well as from the user side, and most likely from the uh, from the publisher and developer side, as um, as ga gaming is going to be pushed to a whole, a whole nother level. Yeah, I think, you know, most of the time when people think about gaming, they just think about the end product. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I'm playing a game on my phone, I'm enjoying this game on my console or my PC, um, but there's, you know, as is the case in any other major, you know, media business, AI will certainly become part of the development experience, right? We see it from an enterprise software level. And, you know, when you look at the tools that are being used today, right? So you have your game engines, whether that's Unreal, um, coming out of Epic, whether that's Unity, uh, mm -hmm. in their game engine, you know, We've seen games go from console to PC to mobile, and the engines have evolved. And it's a it's been a tremendous amount of software developed. AI will impact every single aspect of the game development experience. So explain the engines really quickly for people that are new to this and have not been in the gaming world like us. Yeah. Example. So, you know, if you are a game developer, uh, you are going to choose, uh, you know, one or two, one of two platforms, most likely uh, to develop your engine uh, and develop your game. Uh, Unity, publicly traded business, um, I believe headquartered in San Francisco um, or Unreal Engine. Uh, which is another uh, tool for, for a simplified version. You can think of it as an operating system uh, to create games. And there are a whole bunch of services on top of that. So if you're managing live services like leaderboards or you're managing um, lobbies where you're matching players together, um, all of these have become ubiquitous inside of the, the world of, uh, of game development. Um, and many studios have their own custom, you know, tools that they write on top of. So... You know, when we think about game development, um, you know, great example, non-player characters, right? If you're interacting with a character in a game, uh, right. there is logic and code written behind that um, to allow them a series of decisions that can happen. Mm -hmm. If you think about AI being injected in, the ability for personalized experiences one-on-one -on -one with the game. So if I'm playing, you know, Red Dead Redemption or I'm playing you know, Call of Duty or, you know, FIFA, you know, there's a set of decision trees of what that character might may or may not do based on how I'm engaging with the game. AI is going to allow a tremendous level of customization and personalization for each one of those experiences to continue to learn from how players are engaging, what's being said, uh, what outcomes in the game are happening. Um, these non-player characters using AI to form personal relationships, uh, you know, and so, you know, even in the, the non-player character world, right, there will be a huge amount of innovation that happens. Um, when you think about art and art creation, content creation, uh, you know, today, you know, you, you're going to have a 2D artist sketching something. You're going to have a 3D artist then, you know, creating that model. You're going to have an engineer who's rigging and animating this. And, you know, there's going to be a massive amount of, um, you know, AI increasing 
in uh, increasing the speed um, and oftentimes the quality of those assets. And so, you know, when we think about AI, I think there's been a lot of fear around, will this take my job or is it, you know, is AI going to replace people's jobs? You know, I think you could say the same at the beginning of software. Um, and when software is used well, it's used in conjunction with a human, right? And so we see AI as an opportunity to provide productivity tools, enhance the speed, get rid of some of the mundane tasks that people perform when they're, you know, writing code or they're creating art and assets and leverage, you know, uh, leverage a new suite of software to, to have better outcomes, right? And really produce higher quality content uh, that people will love. Essentially, what's going to end up happening is, you know, I remember when we used to play these video games, you would get to the end of the map and then the character would just, you know, spin their legs for a while. But it seems that with generative AI or AI in general, we're getting to that point where the maps will become infinite, right? And the players that we saw in the background that now will take on a whole nother life and you would have a completely different gaming experience for me than than for you and for everyone that plays again. Yeah, I think that there's, when you think about AI's capability in gaming, hmm. you know, today the experience is going to be one of many branches, right? Let's say 10 branches. You make a statement, there's a response, different statement, different response. And so you're going to go down a certain path or a certain avenue. Um, the ability to continue to learn on the fly, right? To to understand me as an individual player. My experience playing a game is going to be completely different than your experience playing a game. And, you know, that level of intelligence to drive outcomes that I consider the great entertainment experience that might be different than your entertainment experience. Um, you know, when you think about new categories, right? Narrative-based gaming, um, as it is a genre that has seen some peaks and some spikes, but hasn't sustained as a, you know, wildly profitable because it's really expensive to continue to write content, mm -hmm. right? Think about what LLMs are very good at is creating content and writing. And so I think there's going to be, a you know, genres that, you know, explode and become infinitely better um, using AI in allowing content creation to happen on the fly or, you know, be guided in a way in which the game might go from 100 hours to 250 hours of, of engagement. When you look at it from an investor's perspective, what are the key areas uh, of opportunity for AI and gaming and start for startups? And what factors um, do you consider when evaluating such investments? Part of any early hype cycle um, with new technology is figuring out you know, from a venture perspective, what is defensible technology? What is proprietary? What have you built that, you know, can't be replicated on large, you know, infrastructure platforms out in market? And, you know, there are folks who have the massive amount of data that's available to them. So, you know, we often look at, you know, what is the strength of, you know, your machine learning team? How are you collecting data? How are you sanitizing the data? How are you processing? How are you pre-processing it to train on? Um, and so right now, you know, a lot of this is what are your access to proprietary data sets that other people don't have in specific verticals that allow you to outperform, you know, some of the larger, you know, LLMs that are out there and services that have been created. Um, you know, inevitably it's always about the strength of a founder, um, but you know, they're, can you attract the team? Right now, the talent is very difficult to attract. Right? You see huge contracts being offered to you know, engineers and developers that are going to you know, uh, large companies, the NVIDIAs, uh, the Teslas, the, um, you know, the Fangma stocks that are out in the world. Can you attract the talent? Um, and really, inevitably, what it comes down to is, are you solving a pain point <laughs> for the customer? What is the software that's being delivered that someone will want to use um, alongside them to power this experience. And so I think there's a lot of great consumer applications that you see on market that are mind bogglingly good, right? I can create, you know, uh, animated content. Um, I can take a 2D sketch and, you know, create something in 3D. Um, there's a huge amount of churn, 
in those services. Because once you create an asset today, you're like, well, what do I do with it, right? It still might not be compatible and I can't put it in Roblox, right? I can't take that and put it into Fortnite. So what is the infrastructure that's being built behind the scenes to allow an even better user-generated content experience to be integrated into the game? And so I think it's very hard to look at, you know, AI as a pure technology investment. And we've oftentimes, when we invest, look at someone who's coming from the industry saying, there is a pain point in the development process here. And we believe that we have a solution, it's a software solution that is leveraging AI to solve this in a better way than anyone else in the market is looking at it. We have the talent, we have the data, and we know a pain point in in this, uh, you know, in this process. So, you know, those are some of the factors that we're looking at, you know, as we evaluate where the right entry points for us as a fund to invest. You know, because it's weird because the, the, the gaming space is kind of like the music business, right? You have to invest in a whole lot of talent, right? And a whole lot of titles rather. And then maybe you get that hit. So when you look at it from your seat, where you're right now, where you are right now, most of the big hits are coming out of the massive, big, you know, the game, the big gaming studios that we all know. So what do you think AI delivers to entrepreneurs to help them compete with some of those bigger game studios? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the most expensive parts of the game industry in terms of development is art, right? I think there's $40 billion a year invested into creating content, art, and assets in games. And if you're an indie studio, you see it, right? Your art and your animations might be good, but they're not at a AAA title level. So can you use AI to continue to improve the art, the assets, you know, that you have within your game? Um, what the work of was once maybe six engineers, you know, uh, leveraging AI can be done with, you know, three. And so, you know, I do think does this mean that my games get cheaper now? Unlike, <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a massive amount of free-to-play games out in the market. Uh, you know, look, AAA titles will continue to be priced where they are, right? There's been efforts put around free-to-play gaming at AAA quality, right? And you see that with EA, you see that, um, you know, with a variety of studios that have taken up, you know, Fortnite being one of the best examples and monetizing through in-app purchases, through customization, through personalization, through skins. Um, but my belief is you'll still see a substantial number of titles that will still be priced in that, you know, 60 to $70 range. Interesting. Okay. You still have to buy them. Uh, yeah. So, so, all right. So now talk about how gambling in right it is how's gambling going to be affected now that we have ai in regular games and at the same time within the world of sports you know today when you look at somebody who's maybe wagering on a game right there are data sources that are going to tell you the lines and the odds um but you know certainly the prediction models uh that are coming out that are leveraging ai uh, provided another level of sophistication uh, around the world. I think what you are able to do with machine learning and then with AI and, you know, running models against predictive outcomes um, is staggering, right? And I think, you know, you see it in some games, I believe EA ran simulations of the World Cup, you know, the, la the last three World Cups, they were correct in picking the winners in two of the three World Cups um, that came out the running simulations. Um, and so, you know, this will happen as we look at data because, you know, there's one thing about AI that is the fundamental and the very core behind it, which is the data. Mm -hmm. And now that we've seen data analytics, the ability to capture data, right, down to the millimeter, down to the player performance level, um, that's being injected, that's being fed in. And, you know, we're going to see more and more. And it, it's interesting, it's becoming mainstream, right? You see this with Microsoft and the NFL, you see it with Amazon, right? They're layering data, ESPN, right? They're layering so much data, you know, over a game and a broadcast, the insights that are available and they're becoming available in real time, right? So, you know, you look back a decade or two ago, you know, somebody might take a feed from Stats Inc. They're going to have, you know, a series of, you know, this player shoots 94% from the free throw line with less than two minutes. 
Um, but you know, now you're seeing that get to an even more granular level um, in and real accessible. time, being fed in and accessible, and even broadcast on the screen. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think it makes for a, a better you know consumer experience, right? Core fans want to know those types of insights, and it keeps you engaged in the game. And you know that's the main point around watching a broadcast is how engaged are you? Um, you know, with the proliferation of phones, um, you know, and, and other forms of media, everybody's still fighting for. Us. Yeah, so that's that's the next question for you, which, which is how do, how do you see AI impacting the sports industry, right? In the areas of performance analysis, fan engagement, and injury prevention. Again this type of data analysis right when you look at a sports team the most valuable assets are their players right and so you've you've seen an evolution of how we are tracking player performance how many miles an hour or you know how many miles an hour how many kilometers an hour, uh, per hour are they running how long have they been playing on the field but now you're starting to see that data capture in the gym in practice facilities Right, so you have an even more holistic sense. We've seen software solutions that are coming out that are doing analytics around predictive analytics for when a player may get injured. They're reaching their burnout phase. They've played this many minutes. They've trained this hard. They haven't had enough rest and recovery period. And some of those stats are mind boggling. You know, we had a company that presented to us. They're working with a professional NBA team. They were predicting injuries within around 90 to 94%. Uh, you know, and that's just a staggering number uh, when when you see uh, the ability, right? We all want to watch our favorite players play at the highest level and make sure they're not injured. Seeing the introduction of, you know, nights off in the NBA, people resting in back-to-back -back games, um, putting more data and more science behind that and what it means to prevent injuries rather than just saying, hey, you're not going to play back-to-back -back nights um, is, is, is good for the fans, right? It's good for the players, good for the league overall. So, you know, that's just one component right like we're seeing this you know come out in uh you know we have an investment in a company called cam ai it's real-time language translation right um was just in the middle east talks to the you know a variety of leagues here in the us they just signed a deal with the mls and cam is powering this real-time language translation soccer is a global game it might be broadcast in english here you still want it to reach a global audience and be translated into other languages and i think you'll see services like that that are enabling content consumption um, in a different way and the appetite when you have global audiences um, global players and you know now that fans are fans of a player as much as they are fans of a team oftentimes right those individuals go to a different country and they're doing interviews right you still want to be able to follow them in that language and so it's a really interesting phenomenon that we're seeing, and, and that speaks more to what kind of like what is the end consumer seeing from AI, but what's the value of it from my end? Um, and then you know, content uh, creation. You know, you see things like overtime elite, you know, high school basketball leagues. You know, that was started from people filming on an iPhone, right? This isn't a professional broadcast crew when it initially started. And you know, you look at companies like Veo that you know have the ability to use computer vision and turn a game into what looks like a cinematic production that a professional, you know, videographer is filming a game on the sideline, but it's just a, you know, uh, uh, some software, right? Um, behind that in the camera, tracking the ball, following players. Um, and that's a fascinating way to democratize content because the best content, yes, the leagues are amazing. But there's a lot of other really amazing content that's being created. And we saw the explosion of user generated content when you got better cameras on phones, better network connectivity in AI's ability to film that content, to pick out what are the right moments of content that want to be surfaced and be able to share that, you know, it's just we're at the very beginning phases. Yeah. So what do you think is going to be the most significant piece of technology that comes along to, sh to shape or reshape um, the sports industry? It's a good question. <laughs> I don't know if I have an answer for you on that one. <laughs> Can you share any interesting examples of what you've seen most lately that's really been exciting to you, that's really pushing the envelope, um, utilizing AI? I really want people to get an understanding of how present the change is right now so they can get an understanding and, and push their own imagination beyond where we are to what, what is to, to come. 
I, I won't name specific companies, but you know, yeah. I think what you see in some of the AI solutions around video, mm -hmm. like, you know, the ability to, for an average person to create a video that looks like a professional animator or creational, a professional uh, videographer is created is, is staggering. Um, you know, we, we see it on some of the bad sides, right? With deep fakes and what's going on and being manipulated. Um, but I think you're going to see it used for good as well. And on the entertainment side. So, you know, as is the case with any new technology, there are always going to be issues, pitfalls. People use it in nefarious ways. Um, but my hope is it unlocks a level of creativity, right? Not everybody knows how to write code but everybody has an imagination and the ability to use a very simple editor, a WYSIWYG tool, you know, to make art, to create. And, and that's really what gets us excited about this era, particularly in gaming, is we've seen the early stages of content creation tools be enabled in games. But the ability for every user to very easily be able to engage, to create assets, to create art, to create stories, to write, to unlock, you know, the videos that they want. Um, those are the most exciting areas because unlocking creativity in, in is, is really something that's innate to our human nature, right? From sitting around a campfire telling stories to now in an interactive medium, be able to bring that story mm -hmm. in light, whether that's in a game, whether that's in a video. Um, so it's really, you know, something special. And in, I think it's oftentimes overlooked, you know, sometimes in the venture capital world, we're looking for outcomes and that's natural. We're looking for things that can be big businesses and platforms. But as an end user, as somebody who's, you know, been in the games industry, who enjoys gaming and sports, that's the real value. And that's the potential here is unlocking creativity. What are your thoughts around where we are with the technology today and there was always this rush for, you know, for talent around coding. Now that AI is here and we're able to develop code at, at a quality level and a rate that we never had before, what do you tell, what, do you, what are your thoughts for young people when they think about getting into the development world um, now that we are in this era of AI? Yeah, you know, I have a friend who's a teacher and, you know, she oftentimes will invite me to speak to the class and, you know, said, look, I'm, you know, founder of game studios and they're like, oh, I want to do that as well. I'm like, well, you have to be, you know, mathematician, you have to be a computer scientist, you're writing code, um, and, or you have to be in a, you know, great at art, storytelling, there are other parts of the industry, but, you know, really trying to stress the, the STEM side of it. When you look at tools like Copilot, when you look at, you know, what is out in market right now to allow you to be a novice and learn, but also have someone help guide you, right? We used to do pair programming in my companies. You now have somebody who can pair program with you as a computer, right? As a piece of software. And so my hope is that, you know, it actually allows more interest in these fields of computer science because maybe the barrier for some people of thinking, I can't do this, right? It, it's the, the bar's too high, uh, they get frustrated, um, right? And not everybody's a, a master at mathematician, um, but that opportunity to use AI as, a, as an aid, as a guide, as a supplement to improve what you might make um, and then also be able to use an art tool alongside of it. So you don't, you know, have to go and find somebody who wants to work on a project with you that you can do some of that artwork. You know, you're talking about somebody to be able to create a game from scratch, you know, in this environment. Um, and that's really special. And that's something that we haven't seen before that's available to the masses. And we've seen the appetite for it with the amount of engagement in the Minecraft world, the amount of engagement in Roblox. Um, and you're seeing on the UGC side, this is going to accelerate it and make it even more readily available to everyone. So across all of your experience in, as, as a technologist, as an entrepreneur, as a builder, as an investor, what's the most exciting thing that you're looking forward to, to seeing being solved with artificial intelligence? Yeah. You know, as a game investor and as somebody who looks at the world of sports, there's a lot in terms of entertainment and media, but you know, when I think about the use cases of 
you know, solving, you know, disease, um, unlocking, you know, the human DNA and code and being able to create outcomes that will improve human existence. Um, the most exciting areas are certainly around, you know, making the quality of life for others better and for the world a better place. So, you know, as I sit as a human, that's the most exciting space for me that I would, you know, it, that hopefully next generation, my kid, you know, generations to come will benefit. All right. Thanks so much for the time today. It was great to have you on the show. Looking forward to future conversations. Thank you for the time.